Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel. This is Mystery Monday, a Mystery Monday that is probably not going up on a Monday, probably a Tuesday or a Wednesday. It's more important for me to get all the research in and make sure I'm putting together a really comprehensive video for you guys rather than make sure it's out on Monday just because it's called Mystery Monday. So basically, if it's called Mystery Monday, that's fine. Whenever it goes up is a Mystery Monday. It doesn't matter what day of the week it is. Today's video is a mystery that has plagued me for years. And I've always followed it, but I've never got as in-depth as I did when I was doing the research for this video. And I have to tell you, it probably wasn't the best video to research right before boarding a plane myself next month to go to my sister's wedding in Mexico. I'm already anxious about flying. I don't know why I always have been. Before I get on the plane, I just get really stressed out. Something about flying in this huge metal bird in the air so far above the ground, it seems unnatural to me. However, we obviously have to get on planes sometimes if we wanna to go to our sister's wedding in Mexico. So I am getting on the plane, but I will be a super anxious person for the three days building up to it. And when I say goodbye to my kids before I get on the plane, it's like always emotional because this stupid part of me is, is like, what if this is the last time I see them? Anything could happen while I'm out of the country. So it just stresses me out. But nothing ever happens. I get on the plane, have a great time, come home, and, and everything's the same. So I don't know why. I get so anxious. This video is on the disappearance of the Malaysia Flight 370. Literally a plane that disappeared with all its passengers, disappeared into thin air. The world's oceans, covering a vast 70% of planet Earth, hold such incredible mysteries in their dark depths. The ocean's always been a place that's haunted me and intrigued me at the same time. When you're out on a boat in the middle of the ocean, it's hard not to look around you and just wonder what's lying so many miles beneath your feet. The ocean has huge underwater waterfalls that dwarf the highest waterfall found on land. There are lakes on the ocean floor that are more than 300 feet deep, and these lakes are home to aquatic species found no place else on Earth. There are valleys in the ocean deeper and wider than our Grand Canyon. And yet, in all our thirst for adventure and knowledge, we've only explored a small percentage of this underwater world. 95% of the ocean floor still remains a mystery to humankind, which is crazy if you think about it. In all the years we've been out in the ocean, searching for things, trying to discover things, we've only gotten to 5% of it. How many species exist in the ocean and have existed for thousands of years before humankind ever walked the earth? To give you an example of how little we know about the ocean, 297 new species of ocean life were found on a single volcanic rock pillar in the ocean. One column of volcanic rock that we looked at, we found 297 undiscovered species. We've explored more of outer space than we have of the world's oceans. Yes, the ocean is filled with secrets. Most of these secrets we will probably never uncover in our lifetime. And one of these secrets will haunt me forever. The disappearance of Malaysia Flight 370. Since I heard about this plane disappearing into thin air, it's terrified me. How can a Boeing 777, it's a ginormous plane, how can it just vanish? With all our advanced technology and intelligence, no one knows where it is or what happened to it. We have theories, we speculate, but we don't actually know. So strap in, get ready, because this is a crazy story and I'm about to take you through it. On March 8th, 2014, at 12.41 a.m., Malaysia Flight 370 departed from the Malaysian capital of Kuala Lumpur, headed for Beijing, China. It carried 227 passengers and 12 crew members all settled in for a normal flight. The Boeing 777 has been flying for over 20 years and has one of the best safety records of any commercial aircraft. This particular plane had been in service for 12 years and had just passed all maintenance and safety checks 10 days before. And I can imagine these passengers, either traveling for business or pleasure, 
Settling in on this red eye flight, either closing their eyes and snuggling under an airline blanket or pulling out a book they'd been meaning to read for a while. Popping in their earbuds to watch a funny movie or listen to their favorite playlist. Sitting down in their seats, expecting what we all expect when we board an airplane to arrive safely at our destination. Among the 227 passengers and 12 crew, 14 nationalities were represented. The majority of these passengers were Chinese nationals, 153 of them in total. There was a group of 24 Chinese calligraphers and their five staff who had just attended an exhibit in Kuala Lumpur. A couple from Beijing who were traveling home to their two young sons after enjoying a beach vacation in Vietnam. I wonder if they settled in their seats, got their seatbelts on, and started scrolling through the gallery on their phone looking at the pictures of the two little faces they couldn't wait to get back to. A young Malaysian couple who had gotten married in 2012, but because of life and work and busy schedules, they'd put off their honeymoon for two years, finally boarding a plane on that morning to celebrate it in Beijing. I imagine them getting on the plane, holding hands, excited to finally have some time off to be together and celebrate their union. This was their first time ever on an airplane. An IBM executive and a native Texan who had just been transferred to Kuala Lumpur for work, and he was heading back to Beijing where he'd been living to tie up some loose ends before finally settling in the Malaysian capital city. He was very excited about this new chapter in his life and couldn't wait to start it. A former soldier and mechanical engineer from Perth who was also starting a new job in Malaysia. He was stationed there for six months. Before he left, he gave his wife his wedding ring and his gold watch for their two young sons. He said that in the event anything happened to him, the first son who got married should get the wedding ring and the second son when he got married would get the watch. A group of nine passengers who were traveling together, old friends who were on their way home after a trip to Nepal. Two Australian couples who were also friends and traveling together were on the plane. One of the couples had been married for 30 years and the husband had just been laid off the prior year. So they had finally decided to take the trip they'd been planning their whole lives. This trip to China, they'd been planning for years, putting off because of work and life. They never even arrived. The newlywed couple putting off their honeymoon because they were busy. They never even got to have their honeymoon and a 23-month-old boy who sat happily on his parents' lap that morning while his grandparents occupied seats nearby. He was not the only child who lost his life on the plane that day. On the passenger manifest, you can see the names, ages, and nationalities of all the occupants of MH370. And there you will find that there were two two-year-olds, two three-year-olds, and a four-year-old. Lives ended before they began. And who were the pilots? The men tasked with getting the airplane safely from one airport to the other. Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah was 53, a veteran pilot who had been with the airline since 1981 and had since logged over 18,000 flying hours. A married father of three, he loved to cook and fish, but aviation was his passion. He had his very own flight simulator in his home and even posted flight simulator tutorials on his YouTube channel. He lived with his wife in an upscale gated community in Kuala Lumpur. Captain Zahari was well known for his expertise in aviation and his professionalism, and he was viewed by many young pilots as a mentor. One such young pilot was his second in command on this flight. Co-pilot Farik Abdul Hamid had joined Malaysian Airlines in 2007 when he was 20. He only had 2,700 hours of flight experience under his belt, and this was only his sixth flight in the cockpit of a 777 only his first flight as a fully approved pilot. He's described by people who knew him as religious, humble, and quiet for the most part. He was very serious about his career. He was very serious about his life. He and another pilot were engaged to be married and his inexperience wouldn't have mattered sitting in the cockpit next to such a knowledgeable pilot. After the pilots navigated the enormous plane off the runway and into the air, they reached cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. And that is when autopilot should have taken over. At 1.07 a.m., ground control received a perfectly normal ACARS transmission from the plane. ACARS stands for Aircraft Communication Addressing and Reporting System. And this term refers to the complete air ground system, including the equipment on board the aircraft that sends the information and the equipment on the ground at air traffic control that receives it. 
The computer on the plane collects tons of information, such as aircraft and pilot performance, and sends it back regularly to the ground. That way, if anything goes wrong with the plane or something seems off, it can be quickly caught and diagnosed. ACARS also transfers information about weather, flight patterns, cabin pressurization, all that kind of stuff that's important to know when you're flying a plane and important to know when you're guiding a plane from the ground. At 1.19 a.m., as MH370 is leaving Malaysian airspace and entering Vietnam airspace, someone in the cockpit has a conversation with air traffic control. Air traffic control lets MH370 know they are about to fly into Vietnamese territory and to contact Ho Chi Minh. A voice from the cockpit, believed to belong to Captain Zahari, responds, Good night, Malaysia 370. Malaysian 370, contact Ho Chi Minh 120 decimal 9. Uh, good night. Good night is what a pilot will say when he's leaving the airspace. So he's saying good night to the airspace he's leaving. And when he checks in with the new country's airspace, he will say good morning. This is protocol and what they refer to as a handoff when a plane leaves one country's airspace and travels into the next. This is a transfer of the plane and the responsibility for the plane to that next airspace. So when the plane leaves one airspace and goes into the next, they say goodbye to one and then they need to be checking in with the other. Standard procedure said that as soon as MH370 left Malaysian airspace and entered Vietnamese airspace, they should have made contact with Vietnam air traffic control, but that never happened. At 1.21 AM, just two minutes after signing off with Malaysian air traffic control, the plane's transponder was shut off. This would have been just as the plane was leaving Malaysian airspace and entering Vietnamese airspace. The transponder of a 777 is located right in the cockpit on the center console with all the other instruments and knobs and switches. This is basically the plane's GPS. The transponder sends information back down to air traffic control. So essentially turning it off would make the plane invisible. The plane would disappear from air traffic control radar. Now, it would show a blip or like a dot moving, but there would be no name or plane number associated with that dot. So all air traffic control would see was an unknown dot moving on the radar. Now, Malaysia air traffic control would have expected to see MH370 disappear from its radar because it was going into a different airspace and it wasn't looking at the other country's airspace. Vietnamese air traffic control wouldn't have known that MH370 was there until they checked in. The South China Sea is very busy as far as air traffic goes, so missed sign-ins and missed handoffs can be common. And a missed handoff at this time with a very busy air traffic area and a very busy time for flying, the missed handoff would have had more of a likelihood of going unnoticed for a longer period of time. With the transponder turned off, the plane is no longer sending down to air traffic control its location. According to aviation experts and pilots, in a normal flight, there would be absolutely no reason why you would have to turn the transponder off. And the only reason it's so easily accessible for a pilot to turn off is there are certain instances which are life or death and dire that a pilot might have to turn off the transponder. In case of an electrical malfunction, the pilot's gonna wanna turn off the transponder and turn off other electrical systems to try to isolate the problem and see where it's coming from. So the capability for the pilot to be able to turn off that transponder is important. However, it's not common. Also, pilots will often turn off their transponder when they're on ground at an airport so that air traffic control isn't overwhelmed by all those signals on the ground. Other than those circumstances though, the transponder should never be turned off, yet it's so easy to just reach over and turn it off. And it's said that a pilot can do that without the other pilot ever even noticing. However, there is another mode of communication on board, which we briefly talked about, which was the ACAR system. The system automatically sends information back to air traffic control at a predetermined and repeating time. So at the same time, every hour, you should get an ACARS system report. But it seemed like that system had also been disabled on MH370. ACARS sent two bursts of data to air traffic control from MH370, one on takeoff and one when it was climbing to altitude. After that, the system went dark. 
It's also quite easy for a pilot or someone on the plane to disable the air cars system. There's a circuit breaker right in the cockpit over where the pilot's sitting and all you'd essentially have to do is open up the panel and pull the circuits and the air car system would stop working. So with all the communication going dark from the flight, how do we know what happened to MH370 after this? We really don't, but with the help of military radar and satellite data, we've pieced together the majority of the flight of MH370 after it went off radar. At 1.29 a.m., Thailand air traffic control picks up an unidentified plane flying in the opposite direction that MH370 was supposed to be flying in. Here's what experts believe the flight pattern of MH370 after it went off course looked like. Igari was the waypoint that MH370 should have checked in with Vietnamese airspace, but after passing this waypoint, the aircraft climbed to 45,000 feet, which is above the approved altitude for a Boeing 777, and took a U-turn sharply to the west, flying back over the Malay Peninsula and being tracked on radar as it flew over the small island of Palu Perak in the Malacca Strait at 2.40 a.m. It appears after this, the plane continued on, hundreds of miles off course now, toward the southern Indian Ocean. After it passes the Malay Peninsula, the plane falls off military radar. The reason it dropped off even military radar was that even though the military has several stations hundreds of miles out from the shore, this plane journeyed so far out into the ocean that even military radar couldn't reach that far. And even though it seemed as if someone on the plane had deliberately made every effort to make MH370 invisible, it still had a high-powered antenna on it that was blasting off signals to satellites. The plane was sending handshakes, or pings, out to satellites in space. And after it dropped off military radar, satellites received seven of these pings. Even though at the time the satellite couldn't determine where the plane was, where it was going, it did give us some important information, which was the plane was still flying for six hours after it had went off course. At 3.45 a.m., Malaysian Airlines issued a code red on the plane, said it was missing off of radar, hours after it had actually gone missing off of radar. In fact, it had taken 17 minutes before anyone in Malaysia air traffic control realized the plane had disappeared. It was no longer there. It was no longer on the screen. It wasn't transmitting information. And you may think 17 minutes isn't a lot of time, but it's an incredible amount of time to lose track of an airplane. Many critics condemn Malaysia's inaction at this time and the way they handled it. They point to this as their first mistake. Action should have been taken in three minutes, five minutes tops. However, it didn't appear that Malaysia didn't even realize the plane was missing until it didn't receive its 1.37 a.m. ACARS transmission. So... The person who should have been watching the screens, that's their job. That's your one job to watch the screens, make sure all the planes are where they're supposed to be. They clearly or allegedly were not watching the screens closely enough. Before calling the code red, Malaysian Airlines did make some efforts to locate MH370. Nearby airplanes were asked if they could make contact with MH370 and other nearby countries were contacted to see if they saw MH370 on their satellites or if they had any information about where the plane might be. At 6.30 a.m., MH370 should have been landing in Beijing. The arrival departure board at the airport kept flashing delayed, delayed, delayed. Even though the Malaysian government knew the plane was missing, kept flashing delayed. The Beijing airport was filled with friends and family of these passengers who are waiting to pick them up, help them get their luggage, bring them home, go on with their lives. But no plane ever arrived. It really was a mess, and it's an illustration of how poor communication is between countries. When Vietnam contacted Malaysia to ask where the plane was, why it had never checked in, and this was at 1.58 a.m., Malaysia said the plane's in Cambodia airspace right now only to clarify at 3.30 a.m., almost two hours later, that this in fact was a projection of where the plane should have been based on the flight plan and not an actual GPS location that they'd received from the plane. At 7.24 a.m. that morning, Malaysia Airlines reports the plane missing on their Facebook page. The search for the plane and its occupants began in the South China Sea, a place where MH370 had lost contact with air traffic control. 
For four days, search planes and boats from seven different countries scoured the area between Malaysia and Vietnam, but they came up with nothing. They were working on what they claimed, allegedly, was their last known location of MH370. A day later, Vietnamese authorities claimed they saw two twin oil slicks in the water where the plane had allegedly been thought to go down. Once again, the Malaysian government allegedly says they are going on the assumption that MH370 went down shortly after losing contact with the ground, and it must have been leaking fuel as it went, which would account for why there might be oil slicks in the water where the plane went in. It took less than a day to discover that the oil in the water was not from MH370, but from a ship. 48 hours after the plane went missing, while investigating the flight manifest, the investigators made a shocking discovery. Two of the men who were traveling on MH370 that day, they were traveling under stolen passports. This immediately caused everyone to go straight to terrorism, saying that the two men with the stolen passports had hijacked the plane and purposely brought it down. But once they looked further into the two passengers, they realized that they were just Iranian asylum seekers trying to get to Europe to start a new life. One of the young men's mothers was waiting for him in Germany and they were planning to live there together. These men didn't have any ties with any terrorist groups. These men didn't have any criminal backgrounds. There was no indication that they were terrorists. They were just simply traveling under stolen passports so they could get out of Iran and get to Europe. Malaysian officials implore other countries to share any radar or satellite data that they have that could lead to the discovery of where MH370 was. There are 1,100 satellites orbiting the Earth, taking pictures from space and sending the information back down to us. So why could one of these not have picked up the plane and given us some indication of where it was? And if it did crash, would the wreckage not have been captured on some of these satellite photos? Here's the problem with governments working with other governments. Even though we're all people, we're all part of the human race, we live in different countries. We have different loyalties and different policies. Any one of these countries that is your friend today could be your enemy in 10 years or down the road. So you don't want to really reveal to any country outside of your own what kind of spy or military technology you're working with. I mean, just imagine the satellite technology that's available to the public. With Google Earth, we can zoom in and see all sorts of crazy things. So take that a couple steps further and then imagine how insane and amazing our military and spy satellites are, the ones that are actually out there trying to make sure we're not getting bombed, the ones that are out there keeping track of known terrorist groups and things like that. The satellites that each country uses for their own secretive purposes, they don't want other countries to know how good they are or even where they might have been looking. No one wants to show their hands. No one wants to open the door to another country and let them in to see what's behind the scenes. So I'm sure there were pictures from other country satellites that showed what happened to the plane, maybe even caught wreckage, but none of these countries were ever willing to come forward with that. I said I'm sure, I didn't say I know for a fact. I am not at all saying for a fact that I know other countries had this satellite imagery that may give us an indication as to where MH370 went down or what happened to it. In no way did I say that. I just said I'm sure that there is something out there. Don't come for me, government, please, please. However, the US does have some satellites that are specifically set to warning and detecting for missiles. But these satellites would be geared towards detecting heat signatures, and a plane in flight would give off no such heat signature. On March 10th, the US did give information that had the plane exploded in midair, had there been a big explosion like that, that would have in fact given off the heat signature needed for their satellites to detect. And our satellites had detected no such heat signature, so they didn't believe that the plane had exploded midair. On March 11th, the Malaysian government invoked the Charter of Space and Major Disasters, which is a venture between 17 space agencies designed to pull resources in a time of need. The countries involved in this charter would retask certain satellites to basically check on areas of interest. They would then be required to provide pictures to the country who invoked the charter free of charge. 
This would allow smaller countries with less developed space programs access to bigger and more developed space programs like those belonging to the US and China who are currently sitting at number one and number two in the space technology race. On March 13th, planes fly over the region of the South China Sea where some Chinese satellites had said they detected what looked to be wreckage in the water. These planes see nothing. Now, British-owned satellite company Inmarsat had informed the Malaysian government that they had some information. On March 12th, they told Malaysia that they could use the pings sent from MH370 to roughly track its path after it went off radar. The plane was still sending out a signal, like a heartbeat, and it would ping to the satellites once an hour. That is the information that indicated MH370 was still in flight for several hours after it went dark. Now, in my opinion, Inmarsat was a rock star in this situation. This had never been done to find a missing plane before, and they took on the challenge of analyzing the data that they had and making a sort of Doppler image of where the plane had gone after it fell off radar. Originally, they determined that the plane could have only taken one of two routes, north between Thailand and Kazakhstan or south between Indonesia and the Southern Indian Ocean. The Malaysian government came under a lot of fire when after a week of searching, the prime minister at the time, Najib Razak, gave his first ever press conference and said they'd been looking in the wrong place the whole time. He said they had military radar data that showed a plane, which was unidentified but believed to be MH370, did in fact turn back and off of its normal route. He went on to say that this movement was consistent with a deliberate action of somebody on the plane. It seems as if the Malaysian prime minister and the government had access to that information long before he gave that press conference, long before they moved their search to a different area. Yet they continued to allow the search to go on in what they now believe to be an inaccurate place. Just as when a person goes missing, the first days a plane goes missing are the most important and crucial. This is the time when you might actually see the wreckage floating on top of the water before it sinks away into the ocean forever. And this military intelligence, this was a Malaysian military intelligence. And I don't know if there's a person in the world who believes that they didn't have access to that intelligence right away. Definitely not a week later. Or does anybody even believe that it took that long to realize the unidentified plane was MH370? All you would have to do is a quick search and see if you have any other planes that are missing at that point or had gone dark. If you have a plane that's missing and you see an unidentified blip on your radar, it's, it's probably the plane. It's just process of elimination. So it's clear to me, in my opinion, allegedly, that the Malaysian government knew while they were searching in the South China Sea that that was not MH370's last known location, yet they let the search continue there. And the big question here was why? This theory that they had the information earlier is reinforced by the fact that on the sixth day of the search, they moved the search to the Andaman Sea, which was hundreds of miles away from where they were telling the public the plane went down. Luckily, Inmarsat was actually doing something and working with the data they had from the satellite pings, and they decided the most likely path that the MH370 jet had taken was the south one, towards the Indian Ocean. On March 16th, the search is expanded out now, and Malaysia asks for help from 25 countries. Trying to find a downed plane in the South Indian Ocean is like trying to find half a needle in five million haystacks. That ocean is large enough to hold the country of Russia twice. Of all the bodies of water in the world, this one was probably the least explored and the most obscure and isolated. The Southern Indian Ocean has been described as the worst place in the world, especially in the winter. Unstable weather and wild seas would make the search for MH370 not only nearly impossible, but incredibly dangerous for those doing the searching. Aviation safety consultant Jeffrey Thomas said, the sort of conditions out there is a sea that's a cauldron of foam with white caps and crashing waves. It would be pointless and dangerous to be out there. On March 18th, Australia began a new search for MH370. 
focused on 600,000 square kilometers of ocean southwest of Perth using the final ping that the plane had sent out at 8.19 a.m. on the 8th. The plane did not send out a signal to the satellite the next hour, so they knew it must have crashed somewhere between 8.19 and 9.19. They used a sonar to search the ocean floor, but once again, they found nothing. On March 24th, Najib Razak made the announcement publicly that everybody had been kind of thinking privately. The families of MH370 were still holding out hope. The plane hadn't been found. No wreckage had been found. Without some sort of proof that the plane had crashed, they were hoping that their loved ones were still alive out there somewhere. The Prime Minister stated that the plane's last known location was the Southern Indian Ocean. That this was a remote location with no possible landing site. He said, it is therefore with deep sadness and regret that according to this data, the flight ended in the Southern Indian Ocean. Families of the victims received text messages stating that the plane had been lost and no one on board was expected to have survived. That brings us to the black box and there are actually two black boxes aboard an airplane. The cockpit voice recorder, which records all sound and voice from four microphones on the flight deck and the flight data recorder, which records data from multiple sensors around the plane. These sensors take readings on things such as speed, altitude, cabin pressure, oxygen, etc. Both of these boxes are situated at the rear of the aircraft, are designed to survive an impact and water submersion, and they are also fitted with an underwater locator beacon, which becomes activated when they make contact with salt water, and they will emit a signal to be located. There are a few design flaws with the black boxes. First of all, the signal only emits out to a few mile radius, which when you're searching an ocean that is as large as the Southern Indian Ocean, once again, you're searching for a needle in 10 million haystacks. Secondly, the beacon sensors, they're battery powered, which means they're not going to keep emitting the signal forever. The batteries will only last about 30 days once activated. Additionally, the voice recorder box only has enough storage capacity for two hours two hours and then after that it will go back to the beginning and re-record over the two hours with new data that means that only the last two hours of conversation or sounds in the cockpit will be stored on that black box and in the case of mh370 this may not be that helpful considering whatever event happened in the plane that caused it to go off course that caused it to fly out into the indian ocean that happened hours and hours before the plane allegedly stopped flying, which means that would have been recorded over. And that's absolutely bananas to me with all the technology, as much as airlines charge you to, to fly, they can't get a better storage system in their black box. I mean, my cell phone can record for longer than two hours. We're all walking around with mobile devices that have not only the option to record for longer than two hours, but to send those recordings back to a cloud-based system that can be accessed from a different computer. Why does a black box in a plane not have that system or that technology? 28 days after MH370 had disappeared, a Chinese patrol ship detected a signal coming in the water from right around the area that the last ping came from, from the plane. It was thought that this could be the black box from the plane. So an immediate search was put into play. They were working on a very small time constraint at this point. If the batteries on these black boxes will only emit signals for about 30 days, you have a very little amount of time now to track that signal and find it. This area of the Indian Ocean is almost 15,000 feet deep and they used underwater devices, they used tracking devices, they used sonar, and they found nothing. The search continued for many, many more months and they found nothing. On January 29th, 2015, despite the Prime Minister's previous claims that the actions on the plane had been deliberate when it went off course, the disappearance of MH370 was declared an accident. The assumption was drawn that the plane ran out of fuel and crashed into the ocean. Calling this incident an accident would free up the families to claim some monetary compensation, but it would also, once they claimed that monetary compensation, it would also consider the case closed. 
Many of the family members were not accepting this. They weren't having it. On February 13th, 2015, the families asked the Malaysian government to withdraw their statement that all on board MH370 were dead. There was no plane, no wreckage, nothing to suggest the plane had crashed. And it's true, there was nothing found, which is kind of crazy because such a big plane to crash into the ocean, you'd think you would see something. There would be some kind of sign or signal that an enormous plane had just disappeared under the surface, but there was nothing. And an actual piece of MH370 wouldn't be found until over a year after its disappearance. On July 29th, 2015, a fragment of a plane wing, the Flapron, was discovered on French-owned Reunion Island, an island in the Indian Ocean east of Madagascar. This was 3,000 miles away from where the plane had allegedly gone into the water. The 6.5 to 8 foot piece appeared to have been underwater for a while, collecting sea life on it. They got to work at first trying to confirm that the flat run was from the missing Boeing 777. They sent it to Toulouse, France for testing. The results of this test came back that they believed it was from MH370 because it was from a Boeing 777 and there was no other Boeing 777s that were missing or had gone missing. In March of 2016, an engine cowling segment was found on Mossel Bay, South Africa. Rolls-Royce stenciling helped identify it as having come from a 777. At the end of March, the only interior piece to have ever been discovered from MH370 washed up on Rodriguez Island, east of Maratas. It was a main cabin interior panel, and this is the only interior part of MH370 that's ever been discovered. It was thought to be from MH370 without a doubt because the laminate on that interior panel was only used by Malaysian Airlines. In May of 2016, another wing fragment was found on Maratus, another island in the Indian Ocean located 140 miles away from Reunion Island. A part identifier was legible on this piece, which allowed investigators to confirm it was also part of MH370. In January of 2017, the underwater search for the missing plane was suspended. After three years of searching, the missing plane had never been found. And although the search was put on hold, governments in Malaysia, Australia, and China vowed that this would not close the door on any future searching. The search up to that point had cost these governments over $200 million. This is the most expensive search and rescue operation ever performed in aviation history. Despite the obvious high costs to the countries that were involved in the searching, they all claimed that the money had nothing to do with why they were calling off the search. They said at this point they were just searching blindly, and until they had more credible evidence of where the plane might be, they couldn't just continue to search blindly. Many people were obviously not happy with this decision. Voice 370, a lobby group made up of the friends and families of the missing MH370 passengers, they made a public statement. Commercial planes cannot be allowed to just disappear without a trace. Stopping at this point is nothing short of irresponsible. Tony Abbott, Australia's prime minister at the time that MH370 went missing, also voiced his similar feelings on his Twitter account. He tweeted that he was disappointed that the search had been called off, especially if there were experts out there who thought there were better places that they could be looking. On October of 2017, the Malaysian government entertained offers from three separate private companies, so basically ship salvage companies who were privately owned and wanted to search for the missing aircraft. U.S. company Ocean Infinity used advanced underwater technology capable of collecting high-resolution seabed data. Over the course of three months, the search covered 112,000 kilometers of seabed, almost the same amount of terrain covered by previous searches that had taken two and a half years. Unfortunately, nothing came from this search either, and since Ocean Infinity had signed a no-find, no-fee contract with the Malaysian government, they were not paid for their time and travel. And of course, which is always the case with human nature, some controversy did explode over this search as well. Because even though MH370 was not found, several shipwrecks were found that had been missing since the 1800s. 
I guess one of the Ocean Infinity vessels had turned its transponder off right around the time when it discovered two of these shipwrecks, which led people to believe that maybe the whole search for MH370 was never for MH370. Maybe they were just trying to find these shipwrecks and make money that way, you know, buried treasure and the like. There was never any formal accusations or proof of this though. So it's alleged, allegedly. In July of 2018, the Malaysian government released a 449 page final report about their findings and conclusions of what happened to MH370. It said that the plane's autopilot had most certainly been turned off and was being manually flown, but it did not point the finger at anyone in particular. Basically after four and a half years of investigating, they could not say why it had happened, who had done it or where it had gone. Nothing important was discovered in this, this report. So let's talk about the meat and potatoes of this story, the theories. And there's so many, usually I only go over two or three, but because there's so many theories and in some ways I find each and every one of them in its own right to be plausible or at least very interesting. There's so many, so we're going to go over more than we usually do. So the first theory is there was an electrical fire of some sort on the plane. The theory follows the idea that sometimes the simplest explanation is the right explanation. According to Chris Goodfellow, an experienced Canadian pilot, he says it's very possible a fire sent smoke into the cockpit shortly after the crew signed off with Malaysian air traffic control. That caused the pilot to shut off the transponder and other plane systems to isolate where the fire was coming from. According to Goodfellow, the pilot's last attempt to put out the fire was to actually raise an altitude up to that 45,000 point that a Boeing 777 should not be raising to. And that left hand turn that took the plane off course, Goodfellow says this was an experienced pilot doing what he was trained to do, trying to find some place to land. Palo Langkawi is a small island off the Malaysian peninsula and it has a runway and an airport. And that's where Goodfellow believes Captain Zahari was taking the plane. But then the fire overtook the cockpit and the plane just continued on autopilot until it ran out of fuel where it crashed into the Indian Ocean. In the cargo of MH370 were crates of highly flammable lithium ion batteries, the kind used in mobile devices and which have been responsible for fires on airplanes in the past. This theory has been contested though. Experts, aviation experts and pilots say there's no way the pilot could have been an autopilot after it made that left hand turn because there was other turns made and other maneuvers made that would have been impossible to do on autopilot. The plane was clearly being controlled even after that point. Additionally, it's protocol that once a pilot sees smoke, which means fire, to call in an SOS or a distress call to air traffic control, and no distress call was ever made. Another theory along the same vein is that an undetectable oxygen leak could have just slowly taken over the passengers and crew of the MH370 until they were unconscious, not even knowing that they were running out of oxygen. About 40 to 50 times a year, an airplane in the world will experience a rapid decompression, which is terrifying. In August of 2005, Helios Flight 522, a Boeing 727, took off from Cyprus en route to Athens, but it never arrived. It was assumed the pilots had forgotten to pressurize the plane prior to takeoff, so eventually, as they were flying, everyone fell into an unconscious state from lack of oxygen. The plane flew on autopilot until it just crashed into a mountain. So is it possible the flight could have experienced some sort of mechanical or electrical issue which caused the pilots to be unable to control it any longer? It's possible, in my opinion. It's not the most probable theory, but let's move on. Aviation expert and science journalist Jeff Wise has come up with the theory that the plane was hijacked by Russia as a distraction method. He claims that the plane's disappearance came just as the Russia Federation had annexed Crimea from the Ukraine and Vladimir Putin, Russia's president, was getting a lot of heat for it. Putin, who despises any negative press about him or his country or his decisions, decided, allegedly, to have a plane hijacked so that everybody would stop looking at Russia and Crimea and the Ukraine and start looking at what was going on in Malaysia with this plane that had just vanished. Jeff Wise claims there could have been a Russian on board who was able to interfere with the plane systems enough to make it look as if it went a certain way, 
when in fact it didn't go that way. In fact, it was flown to Russia. And yes, this seems like a very far-fetched theory, something you would see in a movie. However, just four months after MH370's disappearance, a Malaysian 777 was shot down. It was shot down over the Ukraine, and a group of Russian-backed rebels armed with a missile from Moscow were apparently the ones to blame. And from what I could tell, Jeff Wise doesn't have any tangible proof against the Russians or Vladimir Putin or anybody. You know, it's just one of those theories where it's like, hey, this could happen. This could happen, but I, I don't believe that it did. Vladimir Putin, please don't come for me. Also, it seemed as if a terrorist hijacking of any kind had been ruled out because no terrorist groups came forward to claim responsibility for this hijacking. And what's the point? How are you going to further your political agenda or your religious agenda if you don't say, we took that plane, you know, we're responsible. There's no point in doing that if it doesn't lead to anything or if it doesn't lead to any change. The third theory is a remote hijacking, and this is crazy. Respected historian and author Norman Davies says technology designed after 9-11 to prevent terrorism hijackers from taking further human life, such as the impact with the Twin Towers, this was being used on this 777, and it was exploited by hackers from the United States. Apparently, there was some cargo or personnel who may have been present on the plane that was headed to Beijing, and someone in the US didn't want that plane to reach China with the cargo or the personnel. So the plane was remotely hijacked twice, according to Davies. The first remote hijacking was at the hands of the US government who didn't want whatever was on that plane to reach China. So they diverted the plane to nearby Diego Garcia, a United States naval base in the Indian Ocean. Then a second remote hijacking happened when another spy noticed the plane was no longer in the control of the pilots and tried to redirect the plane back on course or away from Diego Garcia. And in the ensuing struggle between cyber spies, the plane just, you know, crashed. I don't know how I feel about this theory besides super nervous because I'm sure technology like this does exist. I'm sure it is possible, if you know what you're doing, to take over the control of a plane in flight. And that's scary. That's scary to think about. Like it's great to think that it could happen if there was hijackers or terrorists on the plane. But at the same time, if you're on that plane, you know, you probably know, the government's not gonna be like, oh, don't worry, we're gonna fly you guys to safety you know the government's probably gonna try to get rid of that plane and the terrorists on it, and you're just kinda gonna be the collateral damage. Just thinking that there may be government agencies or super secret spies who are using commercial flights to carry their super secret spy stuff or personnel from one country to another scares the crap out of me. You might be walking into a plane, not knowing you're walking into a chess game between two opposing forces who may have different thoughts about the value of human life than you do. But while we're on the Diego Garcia kick, let's talk about the theory, which states that the plane was actually successfully diverted and flown to Diego Garcia. Diego Garcia was a site set up during the Cold War to counter Soviet influence in the area, and it's still an active military base with many military personnel living and working there. During a press conference in March of 2014, one of the reporters asked the current press secretary at the time about this Diego Garcia theory, and the press secretary immediately replied back, yeah, we're going to rule that one out. However, this theory is one that has held on tight. In the immediate aftermath of the plane going missing, multiple islanders in the Maldives claimed they saw a jumbo jet flying very low over their islands. The witnesses said the low-flying jumbo jet sported the red and blue stripes of Malaysian Airlines, and the last ping from the flight was detected close to the Maldives. And what else is pretty close to the Maldives? Diego Garcia. In April of 2014, Jim Stone, a journalist who runs a conspiracy-style blog, he said he found on a message board a picture with an attached message from someone who had been on flight MH370 and was now trapped at Diego Garcia. The picture appears to be taken in a dark room, so it basically shows nothing, with a caption that said, I have been held hostage by unknown military personnel after my flight was hijacked. I work for IBM and have managed to hide my cell phone in my ass during the hijack. 
I have been separated from the rest of the passengers and am in a cell. My name is Philip Wood. I think I have been drugged as well and cannot think clearly. Show every picture that's taken on a smartphone or even a camera, a regular camera. It has attached to it EXIF metadata. And this data includes information such as date, time, what kind of camera or phone the picture was taken on. It can sometimes even give coordinates for a location. This metadata was analyzed by Jim Stone and discovered to hold the coordinates to the area of Diego Garcia. This data also showed it was taken on an iPhone 5, that the flash was not used. It was taken on March 18th, 2014 at 8.49 p.m. It was also proven that there was a passenger named Philip Wood on MH370 and that he did work for IBM. The online message boards and conspiracy theory community was in a tizzy at this point because this appeared to be legit. With the time, date, coordinates, and the confirmation that Philip Wood was on that flight, it seemed like the whereabouts of MH370 had been found. The journalist, Jim Stone, came forward later and said that the place he had found the original posting was on 4chan, which is a known hoax website where hoaxes and games and creepypastas and things like that are posted. It also soon came to light that there are many phone apps you can use to change the metadata, to make it look as if it came from a certain location, to make it look as if it was taken on a certain time. So this was a hoax, and more than that, it was a cruel joke played on everybody who was hoping that these people were still out there somewhere. Philip Wood actually does have friends and family and loved ones who are hoping against hope that he was alive, who are still hoping to this day that he's alive out there. And whoever played this joke or this prank has a really sick sense of humor and probably actually needs to be locked in a dark room on an Air Force base and not let out. Our fifth theory is that the Malaysian government shot down its own plane. MH370 expert Noel Ogara puts forth a theory that the Malaysian government shot down its own plane and then covered it up. He says that MH370 was shot down within two hours after its takeoff because once that plane made a left-hand turn, it U-turned and it went back towards Kuala Lumpur. And at this point, they thought the plane had been hijacked by terrorists. And so according to this theory, the prime minister was told, hey, listen, the plane went off course. It did a U-turn. It's headed back towards our capital city where they have the very esteemed Patronus Twin Towers. They were afraid of another 9-11 at this point. In New York City, planes had been hijacked and the Twin Towers had been targeted. And now you have this plane which belongs to you, which appears to have been hijacked. It's turned around and it's headed toward the Patronus Towers in Kuala Lumpur. So at this point, allegedly, according to the theory, the prime minister made the call to have a jet, a fighter jet, fly up and fire a warning shot at MH370 to either get it back on its course or to figure out what was going on. But this warning shot accidentally hit the plane and crashed it instead. Noel O'Gara is an Irish private detective and he claims to have spoken to at least five witnesses who visually saw MH370 coming down. O'Gara takes it one step further and says that not only was the plane accidentally shot down by its own military, but the search for the plane was deliberately delayed and it was sent in the wrong direction, giving MH370 enough time to disappear into the depths of the ocean before anybody found it and could actually pinpoint what had happened to it. This is kind of supported by the fact that the prime minister would have had access to that radar data that showed the plane was not in the South China Sea when it was last spotted, but they spent a week looking in the South China Sea. Since the controversy with the missing flight and so much other controversy, the former Prime Minister Najib Razak has since been replaced. He and his family saw a long history in the political arena of Malaysia. His father was the country's second Prime Minister, his uncle its third. He held numerous political offices, including Deputy Prime Minister, before being handed the position of Prime Minister in 2009 when the current Prime Minister stepped down. Razik and his family have been accused of embezzling huge sums of money. And although while he was in office, he managed to avoid these charges, some people think by paying people off, once he was replaced, the investigation into him resumed and they found some stuff. Ooh, they found some stuff. They searched his properties and they found a $1.6 million necklace, 14 tiaras, and 272 Hermes handbags. 
272 Hermes handbags. Do you know how much one of those costs? I mean, the cheapest one I could find was like $6,000. And you know, Mrs. Prime Minister's not walking around carrying no $6,000 handbag. These are expensive, expensive purses. A total of 567 handbags were seized, stuffed with $30 million in cash. Overall, between the jewelry, purses, and cash, $273 million were found on his properties. But billions are still missing from the fund that was set up to embezzle this money. He was charged with money laundering, breach of trust, and abusing his position. He was scheduled to go to trial last month, February of 2019, but it has been rescheduled, and I'm not really big in Malaysian politics and government, so I'm not sure why, but it was. I'm sure there's a good reason. Okay, so the guy might be an embezzler. Allegedly, he hasn't been convicted of it yet, so allegedly he might be an embezzler. And maybe he has some high-class tastes in handbags, but does that mean he would, he would shoot down his own country's plane and then try to cover it up? Yeah, it might mean that, but I'm not saying it does. I'm not saying it does. It's a valid theory. The sixth theory is a very popular theory. This is the theory that MH370 was taken by aliens. I know. And before you come at me and you tell me I'm crazy, I know I feel the same way. Aliens, what? But before you make your decision on whether or not I'm crazy, you've got to listen to this voicemail that this guy, his name was Ty, he received this voicemail and then he posted it on Twitter and he was like, what the heck is this, guys? So listen to the voicemail. Sierra, Delta, Alpha, November, Call, Echo, Romeo, Sierra, Oscar, Sierra, India, Tango, India, Sierra, Delta, India, Romeo, Echo, Foxtrot, Oscar, Romeo, Yankee, Oscar, Uniform, Tango, Oscar, Echo, Victor, Alpha, Charlie, Uniform, Alpha, Tango, Echo, Bravo, Echo, Charlie, Alpha, Uniform, Tango, India, Oscar, Uniform, Sierra, Tango, Hotel, Echo, Yankee, Alpha, Romeo, Echo, November, Oscar, Tango, Hotel, Uniform, Mike, Alpha, November, 0429339642300, Sierra, Oscar, Sierra, Delta, Alpha, November, Gaul, Echo, Romeo, Sierra, Oscar, Sierra. So this message was translated using the NATO phonetic alphabet, and here's what it says. It is dire for you to evacuate. Be cautious. They are not human. And the coordinates provided in this message will take you to Medan, the capital of Indonesia's North Sumatra province right next to Malaysia. This led people to think this voicemail had somehow been sent to Ty's phone from the black box of MH370, and it was its last transmission. Ty also claims that after he posted this voicemail on Twitter, he was receiving crazy text messages in all different languages telling him to take the post down. So I'm sure it's a hoax. I'm sure it's nothing, but it's kind of creepy to think about. And if you want to see more in-depth look at this theory, Shane Dawson made a whole video on it and he actually talked to the guy who got the voicemail. It's an excellent video, so I will post it in the description box. I'll post a link for you. Another theory is that MH370 is in a Cambodian jungle, that it crashed in the Cambodian jungle and it's been there this whole time. Filmmaker Ian Wilson claims to have found the missing plane in the remote Cambodian jungle. He'd been scrolling through Google Earth images when he saw a plane-shaped object in the jungle south of the Cambodian capital. This image ended up going viral and China used space satellites to zoom in on that area, but they saw nothing. This was not good enough for Wilson though, because he and his brother Jack, they actually took a helicopter over the Cambodian jungle to see if they could see anything, but they couldn't because the foliage was too dense. So not satisfied with the helicopter ride, the Wilson brothers actually had themselves airdropped into the Cambodian jungle. And they, along with a crew of ex-Cambodian soldiers, they started their journey from where they were airdropped in to where the coordinates of the plane that was in the Cambodian jungle was found. 
After a few days, Jack and Ian, they claimed to have reached that site, but they were unable to get to the plane. And here's why. They said the site was surrounded by armed illegal loggers who were all hopped up on crystal meth, so they had to turn back. They when you look into this theory further, it seems pretty unlikely. Number one, that area over the Cambodian jungle is a very common flight area. So what most likely Ian Wilson and others who have seen these pictures had saw was an actual plane in flight being captured on, on photo, not one in the jungle. Now Ian up and down says that's not true, it can't be because the pictures taken in March on the Google Maps was, the plane was still there in December on the Google Map images, but it just could be another plane flying over. I mean, right? It could be. And I guess we'll never know until the um, meth addicted illegal loggers find somewhere else to hang out in the Cambodian jungle. I mean, I'm not trying to make a joke, but it's in my opinion, don't come for me, that the Wilson brothers, they went to the site, they saw there was nothing there, or maybe they didn't even make it to the site. Maybe they were just like, this jungle sucks, there's mosquitoes, it's cold, it's wet, it's hot, there's like unexploded landmines all over the place we could step on at any moment. We didn't realize what we were getting ourselves into, so let's make up a story about these crazy, meth-addicted, illegal armed loggers Cause who could blame us for not wanting to continue down when we see that coming at us? You know, who could be mad at us about that? We'll just give ourselves some time with this story. We'll go back and we'll figure something out. In my opinion, that's what happened. Don't come for me, Wilson brothers. I'm sure you're great filmmakers and it was very brave of you to, to go into the Cambodian jungle. Let's move on. And finally, even though there are still 25 million theories about what happened to this plane, the one I believe to be the most plausible, however, I think it's also one of the saddest, is the fact that Captain Zahari took down his own plane. Very early on after the plane went missing, the pilots and the crew members, they were looked into to see if there was any red flags or anything in their background that might suggest they would be responsible for this. And Captain Zahari and his co-pilot's homes, they were searched. The co-pilot was cleared. There was nothing in his background or found in his home that would suggest he was responsible. However, Captain Zahari had a couple things that stood out to investigators. Remember when I said Captain Zahari was such a big aviation geek, he had his very own in-home flight simulator. Well, they looked in that flight simulator and among thousands and thousands of flight simulations, they found one that had been taken six weeks before the plane disappeared. And the path was eerily similar to that, that MH370 took that fateful morning. Now, some people say this isn't an actual completed flight path. He was still working on it because it doesn't have an end. I do think it has an end. The end is in the middle of the Indian Ocean. He didn't plan on going any further. That flight ended just the way I believe he wanted it to end in the middle of nowhere where the plane would be hard to find. The last data point on that flight simulator was approximately 4,200 miles after the flight started, which was how much fuel the plane had in it to fly. So where was he planning to go after that? Why would he end a flight in the middle of the Indian Ocean with no fuel? Some of his supporters say it was for training purposes. It was a very hard flight that was to be used for training. But how are you training somebody to fly in the middle of nowhere, run out of fuel, and the plane goes down? What is that teaching them? You could die doing this? I guess so. Of course, a lot of the captain's friends and family vehemently deny that this is a possibility. They say the man they knew would have put his own life at risk first before ever putting his plane or his passengers in danger. And I am not in any way talking badly about this pilot because I don't know him. However, I would say people change. People change. Things happen to people. Things happen in people's lives. Mental and emotional limitations get reached and people change into somebody you might not know. So you could know somebody 10 years, 5 years, a year ago and they could be a completely different person today. Something could have happened to cause that that change. A 60 Minutes Australia special brings together pilots and aviation experts who tend to agree that this was a suicide on the pilot's part and that he had decided to take the whole plane with him. 
Along the path MH370 took after detouring off its normal flight path, it flew for seemingly no reason towards the Malaysian city of Penang, and then it dipped its wings slightly towards that city. And the 60 Minutes Australia special, they concluded that this was because this was Captain Zahari's hometown. And he tipped his wing at his hometown in order to look out the window and say goodbye to the place that he had been born. The theory is that Zahari depressurized the plane, knocking everybody out first so they wouldn't realize what was happening. This is the reason there was no phone calls or texts made from the plane. On 9-11, when people realized that their planes had been hijacked and it was over, you had people calling and texting loved ones to say, I love you, to say the last things that they wanted to get out before their lives ended. You didn't have any of that on MH370. Nothing. Silence. Nobody called. It appeared that the co-pilot had tried to make a call at some point at the beginning of this flight, but it didn't go through because they were too high up at that point to get any calls out. There's also airline of phones on the plane that people could have used if their cell phones weren't getting service. None of these airplane phones ever tried to make calls. So the experts believe that Zahari depressurized the airplane so people would run out of oxygen, they would pass out, and then he could do what he needs to do, pop it on autopilot, wait for the plane to run out of fuel, and then crash into the Indian Ocean. They say an experienced pilot like Zahari would know exactly how to fly the plane in the way it was flown to evade being detected for so long. He would know the handoff between the two countries would be the best time to literally go off the map. At one point, he flew along the border of Malaysia and Thailand, and he would crisscross over the two countries' borders, knowing that he was never in one country long enough for that country to consider him a threat because he was right on the border and he would be gone within a couple of minutes after that. This was not the work of autopilot. This was a controlled and planned maneuver executed by a pilot who had the expertise and the experience to pull it off. But what was the motive? Captain Zahari was well respected in his field. He had a wife he loved, kids. He made money, good money, doing a job that he was basically obsessed with. What's the motive for a man like this to do something like this? Allegedly, shortly before MH370 went missing, the pilot's wife had moved out of their home and took their children with her. According to Captain Zahari's sisters, their marriage was strong. That's what they saw. They saw a strong marriage with two people who wanted to be together and loved each other very much, but Captain Zahari's social media presence tells a little bit of a different story. A Malaysian Instagram model and her twin sister, 30 years younger than Zahari, received nearly 100 comments on their photos from the pilot, barraging them with requests to come to Kuala Lumpur, where he lived with his wife, amongst other suggestive comments. Not the messages of a happily married man, in my opinion. His daughter claimed that in the weeks leading up to the flight, her father had not been the father she had known all her life. He was lost and disturbed. Both Zahari's children and wife had noticed this new darkness and said he had become withdrawn and declined many attempts to attend marriage counseling. Captain Zahari's social media pages tell something else as well. They showed a disgust for the government that he worked for. On his public Facebook page, he called the Prime Minister a moron. In April of 2013, leading up to the Malaysian elections, Zahari posted, I think, 119 times about his disgust with the government and the way things were going. In May of 2013, when Prime Minister Razak was re-elected, Zahari posted this on Facebook. There's a rebel in each and every one of us. Let it out. It was pretty clear where his political loyalties lay, and that's not a big deal. I don't care about that. But the fact is, you work for Malaysian Airlines. Malaysian Airlines is owned by the Malaysian government, and you hate the Malaysian government. Somebody should have done something. Didn't it concern anybody that this guy was so vocal about his disgust for the government, yet he flew a plane for the government? Additionally, the leader of a group opposing the government, Anwar Abraham, came forward and admitted the pilot was related to him through his son's in-laws. 
He said they had met and spoken on several occasions and that Captain Zahari was a staunch supporter of the opposition. Earlier, when Ibrahim had been asked if he knew the pilot, he said no, he didn't really know him, but he knew that Zahari was a follower of his on Twitter. And then he comes forward and says, you know, yes, we've met and we've talked several times. I'm actually kind of related to him in a way, so it just seems sketchy. Days before the fated MH370 flight, Anwar Ibrahim was arrested on some trumped up charges from the government, which clearly, I mean, we get it, right? The prime minister's government, it was pretty corrupt. Stuff was happening that shouldn't have been happening. And this man was arrested on a charge that, you know, allegedly is not true. And he was sentenced to five years. And he was arrested just a couple of days before Zahari's plane went off the map and disappeared. A person's political view doesn't make them bad. I'm sure there are a lot of us who are not completely on board with the current government's regime or the decisions that are being made, but we are not hijacking planes. Flirting with Instagram models doesn't necessarily make you a bad person. Bad husband, not, not necessarily a bad person. Being depressed, not being yourself lately, you know, seeming withdrawn from your family, that doesn't make you a suicidal monster who's gonna take out 239 people with you. But all these little things put together, right? The fact that he was acting differently, even his own family noticed it. The fact that his wife had probably left him. The fact that he's on the social media Instagram models page constantly, almost obsessively. The fact that he has strong anti-government tendencies and beliefs. The fact that he had his own at-home flight simulator, which contained a flight that really, really seemed close to the one that MH370 flew on its last day. All those things put together, they do symbolize a stronger theory to me than any of the rest. In Malaysia, Captain Zahari is not seen as the culprit. He's seen as an innocent man, and I understand that. That's your nationalistic pride coming in. You don't want one of your own to be seen as somebody who would do that. And there's a lot of people who know him, who worked with him, who knew him for years that say they, they can't believe it, that it would never happen. His family, his sisters say he had health, he had wealth, he had everything he wanted. Why? And you know, sometimes we just don't know why. There is a rumor that he left a note behind, but that note was never found. And if it was found, it's never been disclosed to anybody. So we don't really know why. We don't really know why. But what's most important is we will find out why. The ocean is a big place with many mysteries but the human race has proved itself to be resilient. If we want to know something, it may take hundreds of years, but we will know it. It took over 70 years to find the Titanic, and we still haven't discovered the airplane that Amelia Earhart was riding in when she disappeared. With new technology and a group of people who will never give up and never forget, MH370's existence and disappearance and whereabouts may be a secret today, but it will not be a secret forever. There is a Boeing 777 somewhere in the ocean and we'll find it. And once we find it, the circumstances of what happened to these people will be more clear and we can go from there. Whatever is in the dark will always come to the light. And for now, this mystery will be one of the greatest unsolved mysteries in aviation history. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Let me know in the comments what you think. Let me know in the comments your opinion, which theory you think is the most plausible. I am probably most definitely going to be demonetized for this video. I can tell because of all the government talk and you know hijacking and terrorists. I'm sure those are buzzwords that will just get me uh, completely demonetized. But you know what? It was worth it because this video was one I've been trying to make and wanting to make for a while. I really hope you guys liked it. I appreciate you guys so much. Stay kind and stay beautiful, and I will see you next time. Bye.
Guys. 